uh, speaker, uh, Knut Alfrensen. He is a professor in hydrology at NTNU here in uh, Trondheim at the Department of uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering. And he's also my former PhD supervisor, so it's a pleasure to introduce him. <laughs> okay, uh, so I'm going to say something about uh, ongoing project where we try to say something about rivers in the past. Uh, this is a work that is done in cooperation with uh, uh, the Department of Computer Science, uh, Said Shamsaliai and Odi Erik Gundersen, and a project at this stage was initiated by you, Hal, Hal Rocker. In this respect, he is a PhD student. Okay. Is this working? I'll use the keyboard. Yeah, so the idea with this project is to try to change, to quantify changes in rivers over time. So, uh, pointer is very, very weak. So, uh, to the left you see uh, Lardalselva in uh, Norway in the 20s. And uh, to the right you see a picture that was taken uh, a week ago, same river. So why has this river changed so much? That is uh, what we are interested in finding out. And how can we quantify these changes? And can we understand what different pressures that has created these changes? Uh, we think that we could, we could do this. We could do, find some interesting parts of river restoration plants. What can we restore or what is impossible to restore? And we could evaluate river protection schemes. I get a little bit back to that later. So uh, the possible drivers of change is, of course, natural factors, like floods, erosion, vegetation, climate changes, ice runs, and others. And we have a number of human-driven factors, like hydropower, agriculture, river training works, roads, climate change, and others that we'll get also get back to a little bit more. And one challenge here is to try to disentangle these from each other, to see which one is important here and which one should we focus on. So, and this is just an example uh, of such factors. Floods, or maybe lack of floods. The river training works like embankment and beers, hydropower, large ice runs, and perhaps something that has escaped, at least in Norway, the work of the road and railroad departments. What do they do with the rivers? And uh, the challenges is, of course, that we lack good data on historical conditions, particularly quantitative descriptions. Uh, we have all the aerial images, uh, and we have all the aerial maps. Uh, manual digitization is a very time-consuming and at times very tedious thing to do. I've tried so I know how it works. So the idea here is to try to use machine learning to do this, uh, to train a machine learning algorithm to recognize features of these old images. Uh, and this has to be done on black and white images, which increases the challenge quite a bit. And I think which is also one of the reasons that the actual computer scientist was interested in, in doing this work. So we have our deep convolutional neural network uh, with an pre-trained encoder. So we feed the images into this system and we get the classification out. The pre-trained one means that uh, this encoder originally was trained to recognize pictures of cats and dogs, and then it has been retrained to classify rivers. And without the pre-trained encoder, this was actually quite complicated. Yeah, so we have a, we have a process here where we uh, have the images, then we select a subset, and we trained or we segmented the images. The first segmentation was done manually, then we trained the network, we ran a set of predictions, and we took these predictions and further uh, corrected them to get them perfect. 
And then we use this to retrain the neural network to fine tune the output. And this is an example of the output. An image up here and the trained uh, network down here. You can see that it, tra it tracks the gravel bars amazingly good. Uh, but you can also see that there are parts that doesn't work that well. And this needs to be cleaned before we can use them for, for calculation. Uh, we have the confusion matrices from the test runs for some trials. And you can see that on the diagonal, you have the, you have the, con the correct predictions. And you can see that it's quite, it's quite OK. Uh, you see the same in, uh, for NEA. Uh, here it is also quite OK, except for gravel, where the, the network has a big error in predicting that what, what should be gravel is actually predicted as water. And this had something to do with the image quality and shine on riffles. It shows that uh, there is not all black and white images are similar. So some examples. Uh, I'll show you some data from three catchments. Uh, River Surna, uh, just south of Trondheim, where some of you will go tomorrow. River Gaula, which is an unregulated catchment, just south of Trondheim. Those of you that go to Surna will pass the outlet for Gaula. And then River Nea uh, to the east, a short fix. Uh, but uh, this is uh, a sketch of the uh, Surna regulation. Two reservoirs, power plant outlet here, uh, and brook intakes from both sides, capturing tributaries and putting them into the reservoirs. Uh, the river part marked with red is the bypass reach, where water that is permanently uh, transferred past this reach, and the river reach marked in green down here is the re where you have the redistribution. You have the same average flow, but the flow comes at different times of year. And uh, uh, and then we have some drivers. Uh, something I think has an impact there is climate. Uh, you see that both Gaula and Sun has a similar development in temperature. This is the anomaly from the 1991 to 2020 normal. Uh, this has an effect on the growing season, which we'll get back to a little bit later. Then we have the flow. Uh, and here we have the regulated flow in the bypass reach. You see the typical hydrograph for a bypass reach, the blue is what it used to be, the red is what it is now, and it's permanently uh, reduced. You have water here when the, when the reservoir spills in the spring, uh, and this also has an effect on the high flow. So you had more high flows in the past than what you have today because of the uh, damping capacity of the hydropower system. And we can look at the uh, uh, rest of Surna, uh, downstream of the outlet, we have the blue is the, uh, what it looked like before regulation. The red is what it looked like after regulation. And here you can see the increases in winter flow due to production. And the volume of water in this graph is roughly the same. Uh, we also see the most recent peaks. This one is the storm Gyda from 2022. That actually created a quite a big flood in Surna. So even if the river is regulated, it may still flood. But as I'll show an example of later, the, the, the distance in time between floods of the same size is changed. Yeah, so uh, we took the 1963 images of Surna first. We did the feature classification with the neural network. We did some post-processing to clean out some of the misclassifications, and then used GIS analysis to look at the changes in, in uh, river types. Uh, and uh, if you look at the upstream, the bypass reach, you see that uh, water and gravel is reduced, uh, and forest is growing in area uh, for, this, uh, for this reach. And here we have taken the river and then made, made a, roughly a 150 meter wide buffer zone along the river, so we don't take the entire, don't take the entire valley. Uh, another thing that uh, you see is that, uh, yeah, this is, the, this is the downstream part. 
so this is the redistributed reach from the outlet of the hydropower plant and down to the confluence with, with Vindöla down here. And you see roughly the same pattern here. The water is not as pronounced. The gravel shrinks away and the forest increases. Uh, and one thing that we see in Surna also is that there is a significant uh, decrease in river width. So we calculated the, the bank full river width by combining the combining the water and the gravel, the gravel in the in the river channel, and then took out the widths with 100 meter intervals and calculated the, and looked at the distribution. And uh, you see that both upstream the power plant and downstream of the power plant there is, a, is a significant difference. The river shrinks uh, after regulation. So we could imagine that this is because there has been flood control structures created. So we took the flood control structure map and plotted that on top of the same reach. And you see there is a lot of embankments. Uh, Norwegian uh, authorities likes embankments. But they are all old, built long before the data we have analyzed here. So here the process is most likely less flow that has shrunk this and, of course, uh, adding gravel. Yeah, so, uh, and if you look at it in a little bit more detail, uh, we have uh, 1963 here. And you can see that there is a lot of clear gravel bars. There is a lot of side channels. There is a side tributary coming out here. There is a side channel here that doesn't show perfectly on this map. Uh, if we then go to 2004, forest has uh, filled up many of these power plants. You see they have even put an agricultural field on what used to be the gravel bar. Gravel bars have shifted a little bit downstream. These gravel bars are not here uh, in the 1963. And what is even more interesting here is that um, the discharge was higher in 2006 than in 1963. So uh, you can see that uh, there is a lot of changes here. And the most pronounced is the loss of gravel bars. And that we see both upstream and, uh, uh, and downstream of this. Uh, there is a, a quite new report from Nina on the state of the threatened tiger dune beetle, uh, Elvis and Jäger. Uh, and that one has disappeared from Surna. And this is an insect that is specifically uh, geared at living in floodplains, in gravel. Yeah, so, so we're going to have a look at Gaula, unregulated. You see that on the flow regime. This is the decadal flow regime for Gaula for, since 1961. You see there are variations between the decades, but they follow the, same, follow the same pattern. And there is a distribution of peaks that are uh, also similar over the entire period. Uh, there was a small, unfortunate, choose the wrong uh, data set for training. This is Gaula in 1963. This is Gaula in 1998. The problem here, and that, this is a problem with uh, the method is that the discharge is significantly higher in 1998. And there are a limited set of pictures available, so you have to have some luck to find the discharge. But this is my fault because there are images from 2000 and 2002 that could have been used with a lower discharge. But you see gravel bars in Gaula in 1963, uh, much higher flow here, but you can still see uh, the gravel bars are free uh, under the water. It is, you see closely, it's possible to see that there are, there are free gravel bars in the channel. Another thing that we see when we look at Gaula is that many of the side channels are still intact in the, uh, in the river. So here, the, uh, this is not very interesting for, for Gaula because of the discharge changes, but uh, the river bankful width in Gaula is, is not 
do not have any significant ch changes from 1963 to 1998. So the, the river corridor is still there in roughly the same size as the, it used to be. Compared to Surna, where this has changed, uh, changed quite a bit. So this is what we are now trying to do to generate more, more data. So we now have, think we have a network that is fully trained. We have enough training data. And so the next step would be to do more production of, of data for analysis. Yeah, uh, just at the end, a couple of other things. This is River Nea, uh, 1962. Uh, and this is output from the neural network. You see the river braided with a lot of channels. Uh, another thing that is interesting is to try to see where did the river come from. And uh, uh, we have a, uh, a DM uh, on a one meter resolution of Norway, of the entire mainland, a large collection uh, uh, project. And uh, Kaneka used this DM to move, to, to focus on the river, to make a relative elevation model where we actually see the where the river is the center of the image. And this makes it possible to spot the uh, old, potential old river channels. And then if you put the classification on top of this, you can see how current, or how the current the river has taken over the old, the old river channel. And if you see these pinkish areas here, that's farmland. And you can see that the farmland has taken over much of what used to be the old, the old river channel. And this is combined with, uh, with embankments. And this is pre-regulation. So the regulation in NEA at this time was, was quite small. There will be a post-regulation map uh, not far into the future. OK. And then the last important thing. Uh, this, is, uh, this is taken from a different river uh, because I wanted to, to do something with floods and see how they have changed over time. Uh, in both in Surna and Gaula, uh, both in Surna and Nea, there is a lack of data to do a good flood study. But in this river, we had, uh, we had 50 years before regulation, 50 years after regulation. So we did a flood frequency analysis on those two data sets. And you see that, for example, for a discharge of 150 cubic meters, the blue one is the frequency before. And then this had an average uh, occurrence around each third year. In uh, 19, after regulation, this, the recurrence interval is now 20 years. So the big, or the not the big floods, but the small floods that probably are very important for maintaining the channel, they go f has been increased in, or the time between each flood in average has increased quite a lot. And that must have an effect on the, on the morphology and the habitats. This is, of course, if you live in a house on the riverbank, this is good. You have the chance of you getting flooded is small. If you live in, a, in the gravel, this may not be good at all. So, skip the summary and say thank you with the picture, quite recent picture of River Gaula. It is uh, controlled on one bank and free on the other, which is typical for many Norwegian rivers. Thank you. <laughs>